Welcome to the Albert Hall in London for a very special occasion. It's the royal premiere of the 20th James Bond film, Die Another Day. As Her Majesty the Queen celebrates her golden jubilee, 007 the Master Spy celebrates his ruby anniversary. That's 40 years on the silver screen. Tonight, I've been given privileged access to the man who plays James Bond and has done for the past seven years, Pierce Brosnan. You must really love James Bond. Yeah, yeah. Huge fan. I am pretty excited about this Bond film. It's the 40th anniversary, the 20th Bond film, and I'm hoping they'll give us something special. Oh, and something special is what we got, all right. Bond kite surfing a computer-generated tsunami, driving an invisible car, and dodging huge lasers falling from the sky in a rocket car, chasing down villains in a Robocop suit. Still though, of course, Die Another Day was a huge financial success. It's Bond. It's going to make a shit ton of money regardless. And at first, it really looked like the producers were happy to just continue down this path. What about playing for the fifth time? Is that on the cards? Well, they've, uh, they've invited me back and I've said yes, so uh, it looks like it'll be a fifth. But as we know, that fifth film never happened. Die Another Day was to many Bond fans what The Phantom Menace was to Star Wars fans. It went completely overboard and was removed far from what fans were hoping to see. A drastic change was needed to seriously bring Bond back to reality. That same year, audiences were introduced to the Bourne identity. All of a sudden, the spy genre was getting gritty, thrilling, dark and violent. Jason Bourne was not mucking around. It made Die Another Day seem like a parody of the spy movies, instead of the trendsetter that Bond once had been. This was what the modern day audiences of the early 2000s seemed to really want. Something that Bond ironically had already done in License to Kill, but back then audiences weren't ready for it. Maybe audiences of that time would have preferred to see Die Another Day back then. Who knows, but fact of the matter was, the producers decided to take Bond to the biggest chains up yet. The last seven years have gone very quickly. You, you know, there's a certain, obviously, maturity. And just as you're getting the hang of it, they're talking about someone else coming along. Yes. Show business. It's always been like this. I remember when Connery stepped down. It was like, who's going to be the next guy? So it's the big circus. And the family, the Broccoli family, have always done it really well. Sure enough, two years later, with talk of his fifth Bond film, Brosnan learned that he would no longer be the main attraction. The circus was moving on, and its ringmasters were now scouting for a new and younger man to top the bill. Finally, the name's Craig, Daniel Craig. After months of speculation, the coveted job of being the next 007 has been landed by the 37-year-old English actor. But after four decades of tall, dark and handsome, are we ready for the first blonde Bond? I want to make the best film we can, the most entertaining film we can. And it's not a question of redefining, but it's a question of taking it somewhere, maybe where it's never gone before. In 2005, Daniel Craig was announced to be the new James Bond. They made a pretty big deal out of this announcement, having him dramatically enter a press conference on a boat in the London Thames. To us Bond fans, the announcement of a new actor stepping into the role is more important and exciting than the times when a new Pope or President of the United States is being elected. It sure as hell is to me at least. Daniel Craig being the new James Bond was a pretty big shocker to a lot of fans. Craig seemed too different to everybody's idea of what James Bond should look like. The fact that he was blonde was a huge deal at the time. The first ever blonde Bond. <laughs> Are you going to be dyeing your hair? Because in the um, publicity photo, it's well, looks darker. It looks darker. the light That's me. So you're going to be blonde. Countless websites trying to boycott Craig from being Bond. Newspaper messages with headlines like James Blonde. I remember it all very vividly. I don't think any other Bond actor had as much of a hard time being announced to be the new James Bond as Craig did. Especially in an age where the internet and media were really on the rise. And I'm not gonna lie, I was one of these people. I was 15 when Craig was announced as Bond and I already was a big Bond fan back then. 
I had never really consciously lived through a moment where a Bond actor would be replaced. I was alive when Brosnan replaced Dalton of course, but I was just a child back then. Brosnan was the Bond I grew up with and was the one that was Bond for what felt like my entire lifetime. I really felt like he just deserved another chance and should be given a fifth film that brought his Bond back to reality, like they had done with For Your Eyes Only after the Outlandish Moonraker. Him getting the boot and then being replaced by this guy, I felt like they had lost their minds. It was Barbara Broccoli who ultimately decided to bring him aboard and I really felt like she made a mistake. She had never had to make a decision like this. It was her father after all that casted Braston, but of course he wasn't around anymore to pick someone else. I used to say, this guy looks more suitable to be just another one of those generic blonde henchmen the series has always used throughout the years. I remember seeing the first pictures of Craig as Bond and just not getting it. Back then, this particular picture reminded me more of Indiana Jones than Bond. Hey, I was just a teenager, what did I know? I was still yet to see the actual film. What I did really like was that they brought back Martin Campbell to direct Bond 21. With Goldeneye, he proved that he could take a new actor into a new world and setting and he could possibly do it again right here. A popular thing at the time were origin stories, reboots, a reimagination of famous classic characters we were familiar with brought into a new light. Usually these films would be set in a more realistic and dark setting, like Christopher Nolan had done with Batman Begins and Man of Steel. This was exactly what they were gonna do with Bond. After more than 40 years, the filmmakers finally got the rights to Fleming's first novel, Casino Royale. Something Broccoli and Saltzman had always dreamed of back in the day. The one film they could never make because other filmmakers had the rights to it and crapped all over it too. Twice. At least one thing was certain, I was sure that by default, no matter what Eon was going to do with it, at the very least it was going to be better than the ridiculous 1967 Casino Royale spoof. But then again, you can say that about pretty much every new film releasing, really. So now the filmmakers had a serious chance to completely retell Bond's story, show us a modern take of Fleming's beloved first novel and wipe the whole slate clean. All the 20 Bond films preceding this did not take place in this new universe that were gonna take the new Bond in. And not only did Craig have to portray a Bond that had to earn his stripes as an agent in the film, he too had to earn his own stripes from pretty much all the Bond fans around the globe. A complete reboot in a new and different Bond universe. The ditching of a popular Bond actor that brought the series a ton of cash with all his films. A new actor who was already disliked by the majority before he even stepped into the role. A beloved Fleming novel that they were going to adapt into today's world. This really was the biggest gamble Eon had taken yet. And in 2006, we all got to see if it was one we're taking. Speaking of gambles, right from the get-go, the filmmakers took a risk by removing the beloved gun barrel opening. All 20 Bond films before this opened up with it, a signature stable of the series removed. I was quite shocked to see it wasn't there when I first saw the film. Instead, we got a black and white dramatic opening shot of a building in Prague. Immediately things felt different, so our new Bond is sent out to take care of a corrupt MI6 operative, Dryden. M really doesn't mind you earning a little money on the side, Dryden. She'd just prefer it if it wasn't selling secrets. Immediately the film sets the tone in the more realistic and dark world of espionage. Bond is at the start of his career, still yet to earn his double O status which requires two professional kills, just like in the novels. So we get a flashback of a brutal bathroom fight with Dryden's contact, who we learn was Bond's first kill. Made you feel it, did he? We soon learn that in this film, killing is going to carry some weight. Bond is human, and taking someone's life will have an impact on him in one way or another. Just as the cocky Dryden is going to explain to him that the second kill is always easier to digest, this happens. The second is... Yes. Considerably.
And that launches us into the opening titles with the brilliant placement of the gun barrel symbolizing Bond's very first kill as the blood drops down and the colors burst into the screen. This instantly faded my shock of the absence of the gun barrel as I love the way it was used in such an effective way here. Chris Cornell does a title song entitled You Know My Name, which really grew on me over the years. The lyrics truly bring forward the core of what Bond is all about. He's the blunt instrument wielded by the government. He's a lethal weapon that is very valuable but also easily replaceable. He's Fleming's lone hero. It's great that the lyrics actually foreshadow some of the events coming up in the movie and symbolize some of Bond's character. The title sequence itself is very different too. No signature dancing naked chicks and nipple spotting this time around. Instead, Bond himself at the center stage as we see him as a silhouette fighting some bad guys all set in the theme of casinos and playing cards. We see that Bond has now earned his double O status. It's all very refreshing and promising, really making you feel like you're in for something special. After the titles, we are immediately introduced to our main villain, Le Chief, played by Mads Mikkelsen. He's out in Uganda along with the mysterious Mr. White, who's part of an unknown organization. Mr. White introduces Le Chief to freedom fighter Stephen Obano, and Obano entrusts Le Chief with a shitload of his cash to invest safely for him. But immediately we learn that Le Chief has other plans with it, using the money to put options on the Skyfleet airplane company, so he's betting on the company's failure. Meanwhile, Bond is out in Madagascar for one of his first missions carrying his newly earned license to kill. He's shadowing a simple Bond maker, Molaka. Bond's partner foolishly gives himself away by touching his ear, so Molaka flees the scene. But I really feel like Malaka would have figured it out regardless, you know, with him being the only white guy in the crowd and all. This ensues a chase sequence, not by cars, bikes or boats, but a foot chase. And as dull as that sounds, it makes for yet another inventive new take on an action sequence. You see, the guy playing Malaka is Sebastian Fuken, the founder of free running, which in itself was something quite new and exciting at the time. He gets to show off some of his parkour skills while Bond is trying to keep up with him. The whole chase is exciting and well edited. The part where Bond and Malaka are duking it out on top of the cranes is more breathtaking and thrilling than any of the CGI sequences in the previous film could ever be. They really did a good job in making it all feel part of something new. I always loved the part where Molaka tries to throw away his empty gun and Bond just casually catches it. This is when I first started to admit to myself that I was slowly starting to warm to Craig's performance as Bond. The part where Bond starts chasing down Malaka in a bulldozer is where the older films would have usually blazed out the Bond theme. <laughs> But the filmmakers made a conscious choice not to use the Bond theme at all. It's sort of an origin story, so we are still yet to see him become the character that we know and love. And thus the familiar tropes are absent. At least the soundtrack they used is yet again composed by David Arnold. And I have to say Casino Royale has one of the best scores in the series. So the chase continues. Malaka is way more nimble, quick and agile than Bond, so Bond has to rely on his wits to keep up with this guy. He charges into the African embassy and ends up being completely surrounded. And this showcases a side of Bond's character, him being reckless with his newly earned 00 status. At the start of the chase, Bond clearly states, Holds to the bloody weapon, Carter, I need him alive. But then later he's all like, woohoo, this is the kill, fuck yeah. It shows us Bond's ego. He's never able to accept his defeat, even if that would make him win in the long run. It's something we'll see Bond struggle with throughout the film in his journey to become the season 007 we're familiar with. Fortunately, the choice was not completely reckless as he does obtain Molaka's cell phone. The only actress surviving the reboot is Judy Dance, who returns as M here. And lots of fans have been saying like, how could she be back? This is a reboot, the start of a new universe. She shouldn't be existing here. 
The reason she's back is quite simple. Judy Dance is a great actress and Eon felt like reusing her because of that. And besides, the M she's playing here clearly has a different background to the M she played in the films before the reboot. Back in GoldenEye, she was brought on as a fresh new female head of MI6, a couple years after the Cold War had ended. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Here in Casino Royale, however, she is shown to be a seasoned head of MI6 who have been playing the game for years. The MC plays here was already doing her job during the Cold War. In the old days, if an agent did something that embarrassing, he'd have the good sense to defect. Christ, I miss the Cold War. We're shown once again that Bond is quite a capable agent as he somehow was able to break into M's house. Yet we're still constantly reminded that he's not the Bond that we know yet, as he's wearing a suit that really is nothing special, as opposed to the premium high-end suits we usually expect him to wear. M lectures him about his ego and mistreating his license to kill in Madagascar and even refers to him as a blunt instrument, a great nod to Fleming's description of Bond. So far the movie really does well in bringing Bond back to his roots. Watching this it's hard to believe just one movie ago Bond was still dodging gigantic laser beams in a rocket car. So Bond continues a personal search in the Bahamas. The shot where he just casually strolls out of a plane with David Arnold's great soundtrack playing along is really badass. Having used M's computer to find some details of Malaka's contact, he learns that someone sent Malaka a text message from the Ocean Club Hotel. The seniors staying there mistake Bond for being the valet Barker, showcasing that Bond is still relatively young at the start of his career here. He makes some distractions and sneaks into a surveillance room, once again showing his talents. Using the security cam footage, he easily retraces the guy that sent Molaka the text message. And it happened to be at a certain date and time, right when the dude just happened to be in full view of the camera. I'm not saying the suspension of disbelief is now completely broken, but it sure as hell makes Bond's job super easy. Apart from sneaking into buildings, we're shown that another one of Bond's talents is using women. As he easily charms the receptionist into telling him where he can find this guy, Alex Dimitrios. This leads to Bond shadowing Dimitrios' girlfriend from the ocean, and since this was modern day 2006, the filmmakers made an effort to do a little role reversal with the eye candy. It's not a hot chick emerging from the ocean this time, it's Bond himself. I really have a hard time picturing Roger Moore doing this stuff in the old days. Gone seem to be the days where breast hair was considered sexy, a clean muscular fitness body is what keeps the ladies moist nowadays. However, I do have to say that it makes sense for a field operative like Bond to have a fit body. And it shows that Craig put in the work. I mean, he even comes pretty close to my physique. During the night, Bond joins in on a poker game with Dimitrios. It's already foreshadowed that Bond is a great card player. He beats Dimitrios in a great scene, even winning his car while doing so. Trip aces. Aces win. Oh, and the valet ticket. The car he won, by the way, is the Aston Martin DB5. I like how they brought it back here. If you're gonna do a reboot and want Bond to drive his signature car around, there has to be a reason for Bond to even own it. To me, it's pretty cool for him to have won it from a villain by playing cards. And of course, Bond doesn't stop with just taking the guy's car. He may as well take his chick too while he's at it to get some information. I think something Craig really embodies well is Bond's masculine and dominant side. He's a great example of the modern day alpha male if you will. James Bond has always been a male fantasy. The guy that has women swooning for him is confident and gets away with sleeping with the villain's chick. Of course times have changed concerning the way Bond handles women, but I think Craig embodies the modern day equivalent perfectly. If you're anything into pickup, you'll see that Craig is pretty spot on in making things believable. Can I give you a lift home? Uh, that would really send him over the edge. I'm afraid I'm not that cruel. Well, perhaps you just had a practice. <laughs> perhaps. Good evening, sir, and welcome back. Welcome to my home. <laughs> 
she declines Bond's offer, he remains calm, confident and hits her back with a sly remark. This intrigues her a little bit as if he passed her test. Curious to see what else Bond has in store, she hops into his car, gives the excuse of just one drink. Of course we know she already made up her mind and wants him to bang her brains out. He makes another joke by driving to the place they were at anyway and the ice is broken. I know I'm analyzing a movie here, but it's pretty plausible for a man to charm a woman like this. It's a lot more believable compared to the pickup scene in the previous film. Nothing to see till the morning. Not out there anyway. Solange is perfectly aware that Bond is sleeping with her just to get some information about Demetrius, but she wants to have her way with Bond too. It's a great example of updating things. Hey, if you want strong female leads, it's cool to at least have chicks that are perfectly willing to use Bond for sex as much as he uses them the other way around. Once Bond learns from her that her husband is at the Miami airport, he immediately leaves her behind and proceeds with his objective. I can't help but think that Roger Moore's Bond would have probably stayed the night. Absolutely. There's no sense in going off half cocked. Bond soon tracks down Demetrius, again becoming reckless with his newly earned license to kill and kills him off. He soon finds another guy is involved in this plot too, carrying a bomber round dressed as a security guard to blow up the latest Skyfleet airplane. We as the audience now know that these guys are working for Le Chief, since he betted against the Skyfleet company. So Bond has to stop the guy from blowing the plane up, which could get Le Chief some serious cash. The whole chase is extremely well done, from the tense moments in a terminal hall to a thrilling chase in a truck on the airport itself. There's planes landing, police cars flying around and all of it is accompanied by the great soundtrack. It has a great payoff too, with Bond being caught by the police, having sneakily put the bomb on the guy's belt, blowing himself up, leaving Bond with a sly smirk. It's a fantastic scene. So Bond has greatly foiled Le Chief's plan of plummeting the Skyfleet stock, losing him a lot of cash that he now owes to Obano. He's in desperate need of the money now. Much like Bond, our main villain is shown to be an expert in playing poker. So Le Chief sets up a high stakes poker game in the Casino Royale in Montenegro in order to win the cash back and not get killed. We discover that Solange is killed for spilling the information about Miami airport and that Bond has little emotion over the whole thing. So, since Bond is the best card player in the service, M assigns Bond to join in on the poker game in the Casino Royale and stop Le Chief from winning the money. It's a nice updating of the original story of the novel, which essentially comes down to the same thing. And sure, you can find plenty of plot holes with this. You want me to play cards against him? Yes, so that he will lose. Will the tournament be fixed? No, you must win fair and square, so play cards well, or we will have funded international terrorism. I don't understand. We know he's guilty, do we not? Yes. Does the poker tournament make him more guilty or something? No, but if he loses, he'll be completely desperate for protection from his creditors. But isn't he completely out of money now? Why would we risk him winning this tournament if it proves nothing and only stands potentially given back his power? Forgive me, Mum, but this sounds like a horrible idea. Let's just bring him into custody now. Ah, uh, okay, fine. I'll never tell you anything! You understand me? Never! Never going to talk! You see how boring that was, James? So off to Montenegro to beat Le Chief in poker we go then. The train scene is yet another great moment in the film, as we are introduced to probably the greatest Bond girl in the franchise, Vesper Lind, played wonderfully by Eva Green. I'm the money. Every penny of it. The dialogue and chemistry between these two actors is just superb. It really is one of the best introduction scenes to a new Bond girl the series has ever seen. It's the body language, the clever lines, testing each other out and the witty humor. So as charming as you are, Mr. Bond, I will be keeping my eye on our government's money and off your perfectly formed house. You noticed. So Vesper is assigned by the British Treasury to aid Bond in his mission and watch over a 10 million dollar buy-in that Bond is going to attempt to use to win the big poker match with Le Chief. As the pair arrive at their hotel, Bond intentionally blows his cover. Welcome to the Hotel Splendid. Your name, sir? James Bond. You'll find the reservation on the beach. 
This pisses Vesper off, but Bond has a good rationale for it, explaining that Le Chiffre will have found out about his real name anyway. Again, it demonstrates Bond's overconfidence and ego. There isn't enough room for me in your ego. Bond is also supplied with a stunning Aston Martin DBS. No turning invisible or transforming to a submarine with this one. Instead, it's equipped with a defibrillator and a simple gun, showcasing we're really back to a reality-based world of espionage. Bond also meets up with his contact, Mathis, who is played by Giancarlo Giannini. And I'm not sure if it's stated, but I'm pretty sure he's supposed to be French, like in the novel, even though he's the most Italian-sounding Frenchman ever. Buongiorno, Senor Bond. I am René Mathis, your new amigo. Let's order some spaghetti, macaroni, and tagliatelli. Mamma mia, I love being French. The movie takes some time to make a pretty big deal out of Bond wearing his signature tuxedo for the first time. Kinda in the same way they made it a big deal when Bruce Wayne was first going to wear the famous Batsuit. I love these little touches. If you're gonna do a reboot and slowly bring back staples of the franchise, like his signature car and tuxedo, then this is the right way to do it. I'm surprised they didn't make a big thing out of Bond getting a wall to PPK. Speaking of signature things brought back, his favorite cocktail is also reintroduced, for the first time in the way Fleming described it. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lille, shake it over rice and then add a thin slice of lemon for you. Yes sir. So this whole time the movie has been building towards the big poker match between Bond and Le Chiffre. There's a great little moment of the two finally meeting face to face, clearly already aware of each other's backgrounds. And you must be Mr. Bliss's replacement. Welcome Mr. Beach. Or is that Bond? Uh, I'm a little confused. Well we wouldn't want that would we? Unlike the novel where Bond is up against Le Chief playing Baccarat, here the big poker game takes place over several days. I think updating the game to poker was a great move, especially because Texas Hold'em was at the height of popularity at the time anyway. Me and my friends were playing it all the time in high school in 2006. Also interesting to know is that the Asian lady playing along on the poker table is the same actress playing the Chinese chick from the pre-title sequence in You Only Live Twice. The big poker game itself is filmed masterfully, much like Fleming was able to keep you turning the pages writing about the big Baccarat game in the novel, Campbell is able to keep you at the edge of your seat with great filmmaking. The close-up shots of the actor's eyes, the tension in the music, the dramatic reveal of the cards, even if you've never played poker before, the film makes it very accessible and easy to follow what's going on. It also helps that the game is split up into several moments and that a lot of stuff happens in between. The interesting thing about Le Chief is that he's essentially a small time villain. The first villain Bond is up against. He's pretty menacing with his scary menstruating eye and the calculated way in which he plays poker. But he dwarfs into comparison next to bigger villains, like when Obano threatens to kill him because he lost all the money to the Skyfleet airplane. This also follows into one of the best fights of the series between Obano and Bond in the stairway. It's pretty damn brutal. Like I said earlier, killing in this movie is a serious thing. <laughs> It's pretty clear that Vesper is all shook up by the whole event and it even takes a toll on Bond as well, as we see him staring into the mirror, calming his nerves with a drink. He is expected to be able to kill in cold blood, but Bond is still a human being. And Craig is able to communicate to the audience what's going on in Bond's mind. This is where Craig completely convinced me that he was indeed the right man for the job. Not since Dalton have we seen the character be this realistic and closer to Fleming's envision. This is all soon followed by an intimate moment of Bond and Vesper in the shower. Not naked or anything, just with clothes on. It's a bit melodramatic, but somehow in the context of the film, it works. Bond and Vesper have just lived through a pretty violent and moving moment together and this is where Bond is starting to develop his feelings for her. As the poker game resumes the next day, Bond is defeated by Le Chiffre after he was tipped off about his tell, now pretending to be bluffing to Bond. And Vesper refuses to give Bond any more funds, saying he lost because of his ego. 
And that same ego comes into play once again, as Bond is unwilling to accept defeat, he gets reckless again and grabs a knife and is about to kill the sheaf. This is when we're introduced to another familiar trope of the series. Funny game, right? Sorry, I should have introduced myself, seeing as we're related. Felix Leiter, a brother from Langley. Jeffrey Wright easily is the best Felix Leiter in the series. Even if he's not around in the movie for that long, he's still more memorable than pretty much all Felix Leiters that came before him. He portrays him as the cool, smooth and quiet type. And just like in the novel, he puts Bond's mission back on track by refunding him so he can rebuy into the game. This time Bond is on the winning side of things. Until he drinks a poisoned martini, leading into another tense scene. Bond has to use his defibrillator to save his life, and he almost doesn't make it. Besides being great with the realistic side of Bond, Craig is also extremely good with the humor. You okay? Me? I'm sorry. That last hand nearly killed me. As the poker game continues once again, Bond finally manages to defeat Le Chief in a pretty cool moment, hitting him with a straight flush. He celebrates his win over drinks with Vesper, who soon ends up getting kidnapped by Le Chief. Bond soon rushes over to rescue her, but ends up wrecking his car in a pretty spectacular crash, falling right into Le Chief's trap. Just like in the novel, Bond gets tortured in probably the best torture sequence the series ever saw. Bond is stripped naked onto a chair and his genitals get severely punished. Whenever dark moments of Fleming's world are put onto the screen, you're always shocked quite how dark and brutal it really is. We're not watching a kid's movie here. Of course Bond refuses to give Le Chief the money that he won in the poker game, and he keeps his mouth shut in the most hilarious way. Ah! Yeah! Ah! Ah! Mm! Yes! Yes! Now the whole world's gonna know that you don't scratch your fucking balls. <laughs> but soon, Bond does realize that he's interchangeable. You better arm yourself because no one else here will save you, the house will betray you and they will replace you. Coming to the realization that he's just a blunt instrument wielded by the government, they won't be out here to save him, you can see the genuine fear Craig puts on. Fortunately, the mysterious Mr. White reappears and kills the chief immediately making us curious what mysterious organization they were part of, and if we are going to learn more about it in the future films in this new rebooted era. Bond wakes up in a hospital in Italy and the movie throws some doubts at us whether or not Mephis can be trusted. Something that wasn't the case in the novel, and Bond and Vesper start sharing some more intimate moments, both of them falling in love with each other. And although the dialogue between them started off extremely strong and witty, here things do become a little bit too much of a soap opera. Whatever is left of me. Whatever is left of me. Whatever I am. I'm yours. When I made woman. It is, however, all part of what made Bond the character we know now. Him falling in love with the wrong woman, losing his heart to her, which becomes a big reason why he's never able to truly love again, and why he's always betting countless beautiful girls without any further emotions. Here, Bond is not at that stage yet. He puts all his trust into Vesper, resigns the Secret Service, and the pair enjoys a romantic holiday in Venice. Soon, however, M calls Bond to let him know that the money was never deposited, and so he soon realizes it's Vesper that has stolen it. The realization hits him hard, still unwilling to accept Vesper is truly doing this. You can really feel Bond's heart pounding with the suspenseful music playing, eventually finding out Vesper is indeed meeting a contact. He quickly accepts the truth, switches off his emotions and turns back on the cold-blooded professional side. It always gives me shivers, and it's what makes Bond, James Bond, and Casino Royale cannot be praised enough for moments like that. We soon learn that Vesper made a deal with the same mysterious organization that Mr. White is part of. It all leads into a big climax scene with Bond fighting off people from the mysterious organization in a collapsing building, and Vesper is about to commit suicide. 
It's a pretty emotional scene, with Bond trying his absolute best to still save her life regardless and seeing Vesper slowly drown to death, scared out of her mind. Bond doing his absolute best to bring her back to life. Before seeing the movie, I criticized Barbara Broccoli for casting Craig in the role, but I'm so happy to be proved wrong and in Barbara Broccoli's own words, she summed up this particular side of Bond perfectly. Bond is an assassin. He can't have a family, he can't have a wife. He carries a heavy burden, having to go out and fight to protect all of us. It's pretty crazy. Beforehand, I just didn't get it. But after seeing this movie, not only did Craig completely convince me, I thought he was one of the best Bonds ever. M informs Bond that Vesper was blackmailed into becoming a double agent for the mysterious organization. They threatened to kill her boyfriend if she didn't obey. She made a deal with Le Chief to spare Bond's life in exchange for the money. Bond simply responds coldly with the same line that ended the superb novel. The bitch is dead. It's great to see the nod back to Fleming here, and this whole scene shows us the mindset Bond is now in, never able to fully trust anyone anymore, not able to ever let his emotions take the upper hand. With these experiences, Bond has now become closer to the character we know. Vesper did leave him the location of the mysterious Mr. White, so Bond can continue to track down this mysterious organization he was part of. And this leads into one of the greatest ending scenes in the series. Hello? Mr. White? Who is this? Ah! And as we see Mr. White crawling along, we see Bond now emerging in the high-end clothes we expect him to wear, now fully becoming the man we know him to be, uttering his immortal line for the first time. The name's Bond. James Bond. And that's when they finally blaze out the Bond theme for the first time in the film. It simply is absolute genius. And I, for one, couldn't wait to see what else was in store next in this new rebooted world of Bond. Casino Royale simply blew everything out of the water. All doubts fans initially had about Daniel Craig or the reboot were quickly demolished when this hit the theaters. And Craig went from being seen as a horrible casting choice beforehand to being called the best James Bond ever straight from his debut. He just crushed the skepticism and you really got to hand it to him. Rebooting the series was a very risky move, something I didn't even realize was needed this badly, but after first seeing this movie, I couldn't be happier as a Bond fan with the direction they decided to take with it. Moving away from the standard blueprint of a Bond movie for once was a stroke of pure genius. Even if there is no Bond theme until the end credits or hardly any gadgets, no Q, no money penny, it gave the film some room to focus on other aspects to make it a great movie. Like the character of Bond himself who finally is at the center stage again. Craig made it a joy to watch Bond develop as the rookie agent struggling with his ego, fighting both externally and internally. Charming girls, winning proudly and being beaten badly. For the first time in years, a lot of Fleming was breeding in the series again. The reboot gave everything a bit more levity and meaning. The characters are all less one-dimensional and with Eva Green's Vesper, we get one of the most meaningful Bond girls the series ever saw. I'm glad they remained faithful to their doomed romance as told by Fleming. The story goes a little deeper and is told in a straightforward and effective way, keeping things down to earth and realistic while still making it an incredible action-packed watch. The soundtrack and cinematography is all top-notch. I mean, apart from seeing some older 2006 cell phones and such, it really holds up as a movie that looks like it could have very well been made today. And though a lot of fans really had to get used to the drastic fresh new take the series took with this reboot, in retrospect you really have to come to the conclusion that what the filmmakers made here is the potential best James Bond movie ever. Are you a fan of my work and you just can't wait for other episodes or content to come up to the channel? Well, you can now join the DBF community on my Patreon page. Supporting my channel grants you access to all my latest videos two weeks before the regular viewers get to see it. Your name will also be included on the Supporter Hall of Fame. 
and you get a vote for the new content. And as a bonus for signing up, you will receive a personal thank you video from me, as well as these custom Blu-ray covers that I designed myself. These will all be received by email immediately, so you can pop them out of your printer and put them in empty Blu-ray covers to have your own DBF Blu-ray collection on your shelf. All support for giving back to my channel is appreciated immensely. You can find the link in the description and make sure you subscribe to the channel. Thanks a lot guys.